What would you do if you found yourself in a field amidst a host of children who are yelling, shouting, cursing, and making all sorts of mischief? St. John Bosco was first confronted with such a scene in a dream he had at the age of nine. In his dream, he attempted to subdue the children. At first, he tried persuasion, but he soon resorted to threats and blows. Then the rascals turned into all sorts of wild beasts. A mysterious man came up to him and said, No, don't use violence. Be gentle if you want to win their friendship. Then the wild beast changed into timid, submissive lambs, while a woman's kindly voice rose sweetly above the scene and said to him, Take your crook and lead them out to pasture. Upon waking, John Bosco had a strong conviction that he was being called to the priesthood. Born of Francis and Margaret Bosco on August 16, 1815, the future saint was the youngest of three sons. Francis, a peasant farmer of the Piedmont area of northern Italy, died of pneumonia only two years after John's birth. Margaret, a devout and industrious woman, did not remarry, but rather managed a home and the three children alone. Although she was illiterate, she had a good grasp of the catechism and solid prayer life, which she diligently passed on to her boys. After John experienced his dream about the children for the first time, Margaret took seriously his desire to become a priest and immediately began to pray and look for an opportunity for John to begin his studies. The opportunity arose when a group of local people, including the aged priest Don Colasso, were walking home after attending a nearby mission, a parish mission. To make the time pass, Don Colasso sought to test young Bosco's grasp of the mission. He was astounded to discover that the lad had not only memorized the talks, but also comprehended them, since he could break down each talk into a logical outline. Realizing the boy's potential, Don Colasso offered to teach him Latin. This was the beginning of an arduous and long trial of education. John's education was difficult, not because he lacked talent, but because he was a peasant. Both the teachers and the students of the local schools shunned the poor boy from the peasant districts. His oldest brother, Anthony, did everything to convince John against becoming a priest as well. It seemed everybody was against him. And finally, John had to walk up to 12 miles a day to attend school while still helping his brother Anthony in the fields. Yet this same peasant boy would someday become a master of the pen, publishing over 130 works, including tracts on religion, apologetic works, school books, histories, biographies, and novels. And he is one of the patrons of writers. Yet John Bosco, his talents extended beyond the classroom, for he was very athletic and nimble, able to perform acrobatic feats to thrill almost any audience. He even put on his own Sunday afternoon shows, pull off sleight of hand, magic tricks, juggling, tightrope walking, and other acrobatics. The price of admission, everyone present, must join in praying the rosary or listening to a summary of the morning sermon. All his life, he remained an enthralling storyteller. Once he found an older acrobat distracting people from attending Sunday Mass in the town square. Sizing up the situation, he challenged this man to a duel, an acrobatic duel. If he won the man would have to vacate the area and leave the people to fulfill their obligations. The challenge accepted. They performed their acrobatics without either clearly winning the victory. Finally, it was decided that whoever could climb the highest in the nearby tree would win. Up went the acrobat. 
It seemed impossible to go any higher without falling. Bosco bested him. He went up and did a handstand on the upper limbs such that his feet stuck out of the top of the tree. He won. After Don Colosso died, John attended various local schools without much progress until he entered a school of liberal arts in nearby Chieri. In order to keep his place in school, he had to work various odd jobs like tailoring and making shoes. After graduation in 1834, Bosco contemplated joining the Franciscans in order to alleviate the financial burden of tuition his family and friends were paying on his behalf. But after seeking the advice of his new confessor, St. Joseph Cafaso, he entered the local seminary in Chieri. The portion of John's seminary training that was not paid by the charity of others or the monetary awards won by talent contests Don Cafaso himself paid. Now here is the advice of Bosco's mother, Margaret, at that time when he took on the habit, the cassock. She said, Now you have put on your cassock, my dear John. You can surmise the joy and the sweetness that fill my heart with this event. But remember that it is not the habit that honors your state, but the practice of virtue. If you should unfortunately ever come to have any doubts as to your vocation, I beg you to do nothing unworthy of your cloth. Take it off at once. For I would rather have my son should be a poor peasant than a priest who neglects his duty. When you came into the world, I consecrated you to the Blessed Virgin. When you began your schooling, I recommended you almost exclusively to the Madonna. Now I beg you to belong to her entirely. Love those who love her. And if you are someday a priest, constantly promote devotion to the good mother. With advice like that from a mother, wow, how could John fail? Over six years later, John was ordained on June 5th, 1841, and immediately received three offers, three positions. But once again, Don Cafaso counseled him to continue his studies by entering a seminary in Turin that was specifically established to ensure a sound complement of theological studies for the younger clergy. The rule at the seminary was designed to train the young clerics gradually to the indispensable habits of the sacerdotal life, morning and evening prayers, visits to the Blessed Sacrament, recitation of the Holy Rosary, half an hour's meditation, a quarter of an hour's spiritual reading, all of these in common, weekly confession, a slight mortification on Fridays, silence except during recreation, monthly recollection, study in common, a daily evening walk in pairs, far from much frequented places, and public shows and going to cafes were strictly forbidden. No theaters. Once at Turin, Don Bosco not only studied the mysteries of our faith, but also discovered the field of his apostolate. Turin, the capital of Piedmont, was quickly developing. Between 1838 and 1848, Turin's population increased 17%, and in the next 10 years, another 31%. Consequently, hordes of boys descended on the capital from all over Piedmont and beyond, looking for work in the thriving mills, factories, and construction projects. Cheap labor, right? Many of the youths coming to the city were orphans. Others were seasonal farm workers, and some were from broken families running away. On December 8, 1841, while waiting for a server in the sacristy, Our Lady's Feast Day, a, boy, a poorly clad boy of 16 stumbled into the room without any apparent motive. John Bosco quizzed the boy and found him to be uncatechized, illiterate, and an orphan. Our Lady had sent John his first client. 
The youth returned to Bosco for training in the catechism with some of his friends. This was the beginning. Soon one boy turned into 10 and 10 into 50 until John had 300 boys calling on him by the time he graduated from the seminary. Every Sunday and feast day, he gathered these poor, abandoned youths of Turin, heard their confessions, said Mass for them, preached in a language they could understand, in other words, at their level, led them in games and hikes, told them stories, and listened to their problems. During the week, he visited them in their homes, if they had them. If not, he found places for them to have a home, places to stay. In the following two years, the number of boys would grow to several hundred. Such large numbers caused problems because there was no place in Turin that would put up with them for very long. Every time a place was arranged, the group would soon ask to leave. Now, it was during this time that the clergy of Turin, even some of Don Bosco's closest friends, thought he was going insane. He kept telling them of what they thought were outlandish, grandiose plans, such as his saying, I shall soon have a large building with playgrounds, evening classes, workshops, a church to hold 500 lads, and plenty of priests, catechists, masters, foremen to help me in my works. Upon hearing such plans repeated, a couple of the clergy decided to have him evaluated. They contracted or contacted two ecclesiastics from Turin who showed up to verify what they had heard about the previously high esteemed Don Bosco. Once they heard for themselves that he had become unhinged or megalomaniac, they asked him to go for a little ride in their carriage. After Don Bosco tricked them to enter the carriage without him, he sharply bade the driver to make haste for the asylum. When the carriage arrived inside the gates of the asylum, many embarrassing hours were required to straighten out the misunderstanding. Henceforward, no one said anything about the incurable mental affliction of Don Bosco. The realization of Bosco's, John Bosco's grandiose plans began to take place in 1846 when he leased and soon purchased an old house with its attached shed and fields. The shed he turned into a chapel. The house into a home for himself and his mother. This was the humble beginnings of what he envisioned as a place of prayer and spiritual formation and other levels of formation, calling it the oratory. It was much more than that, though. As I said, it has other levels of formation. For it was a place to play and make friends, a school, an employment service, and later became a home for many. In 1851, the makeshift chapel located in the shed was replaced by a church named after the patron of the oratory, St. Francis de Sales. In 1852, a dormitory was built to house 150 boys. And in 1853, a factory was also built that enabled many boys to work at home away from corruptive outside influences. In the factory, the boys learned trades such as binding, cobbling, tailoring, and printing. The intellectually talented boys were sent to school, after which they returned to teach others. The oratory was so successful that before long, two more oratories were opened in Turin itself. By 1850, Don Bosco began to single out the lads that had potential for priestly vocations. Twenty-two of these boys remained to become the first to take the habit of Don Bosco's fledgling religious congregation, the Society of St. Francis de Sales, commonly known as the Salesians of Don Bosco. Rapid expansion continued so that by 1863, oratories were established in other Italian cities, followed by, in 1875, by establishments in France and Spain and England and eventually in almost every country of South America. In 1872, with Sister Mary Dominica Mazzarello, Bosco founded the Daughters of Mary Help of Christians to do the same work for poor girls that the Salesian priests and brothers were doing for boys. At the time of John Bosco's death, 
In 1888, the Salesians numbered 1,400. Now, the method employed by St. John Bosco in dealing with his fellow man, and especially children, is a method worthy of consideration and imitation. After all, it came to him from Our Lady herself, and this method produced saints like Michael Rua and Dominic Savio, the first schoolboy to be canonized. Just what is this method? First of all, before his ordination to the priesthood, Don Bosco made a resolution to imitate the charity and gentleness of St. Francis de Sales. As a result, he never used direct punishment on his boys, but instead used friendliness, appreciation of effort, fostering a sense of responsibility and removing the occasions of disobedience. Furthermore, he sought to establish a partnership between himself and the young. He brought in the street urchins and transformed them into lambs through his love and constant concern. He trained them in ways of Christian living, bringing them to frequent confession, frequent communion, and common recitation of the rosary. He trained them in the trades of the world so that they could live a respectable life. That was secondary. Primary was a spiritual. They, in turn, helped the newcomers along the same path and grew up to become good religious, good husbands, and always good citizens. Blessed Michael Rua, who took his place as superior of the Salesians after he died in 1888, has this to say, to pass on what he did. So Don Rua wrote this to his sons about devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. He said, nothing could be more Salesian than this devotion, because it is the sacred heart of our master that will draw, as educators, the very pure love for youth the gentleness and the leniency that must accompany our words and our actions, the patience in the frustrations and trials inherent in our task, the spirit of sacrifice and zeal for souls. Later, in his circular letters to the Salesians, Don Rua recommended youth clubs above all, insisting that they keep their first goal, the first goal of the Salesians under John Bosco, music, Theater and sports are means to an end, nothing more, he wrote. Where they are useful and nowhere else can they be used, but always with prudence to draw in the youth and to ensure their perseverance. The goal is the teaching of religion and the formation of souls, not to play a game not to enjoy some pastime. Sometimes we can get confused about these things. So we too can imitate John Bosco's method by treating our fellow man with gentleness and patience. He abhorred peer pressure. He didn't like it. He didn't use it, and it wasn't effective. From his notes before ordination, St. John Bosco wrote this, A priest never goes to heaven or hell alone. If he is faithful to his vocation, he goes to heaven with the souls which his good example has saved. If he does ill and scandalizes his brethren, he goes to hell with the souls damned through his bad example. This thought will help me to strain every nerve to keep the following resolutions. Here are some of them. I will be scrupulous in the use of my time. When the salvation of souls is at stake, I will be always ready to suffer, to act, and to humiliate myself. May the charity and gentleness of St. Francis de Sales illumine every step I take. Will always show myself satisfied with the food set before me, unless it be really harmful to my health. Since work is potent weapon against the enemies of my salvation, I will give only five hours a night to sleep. In the day, especially after lunch, I will take no rest except when ill. Every day I will devote some time to meditation and to spiritual reading. During the day, I will make a short visit 
at any rate, a prayer to the Blessed Sacrament. My preparation for Mass shall take at least a quarter of an hour, and so shall my thanksgiving. These are resolutions of a saint before he's ordained. In his great build-up of his work at Turin, his mother Margaret came to him saying mournfully one day, I can't do it anymore. You see all the trouble I take and yet nothing comes of it. I can't stand these boys. Today I find all the washing I had hung up, trampled on the ground. Yesterday they ran over all my growing vegetables. Some come back at night with their clothes all in rags, others without neckties or shoes or handkerchiefs. Some of them hide their shirts. Others take my saucepans to play with. It takes hours to find all these things. I have had enough of it. I tell you, I can't go on any longer. And just think how quiet I was at Betchy doing my spinning. Let me go back to end my days there. Don Bosco's only reply was to point to the crucifix hanging on the wall. Mother Margaret understood and her eyes filled with tears. You are right. You are right, she said, went back down and put on her apron. January 31st, 1888, Don Bosco rendered his soul to God. Shortly thereafter, received in an audience by Leo XIII, Blessed Michael Rua told him, I still hear Don Bosco telling us again and again, a few hours before his death, the Pope, the Pope. The Salesians must defend the Pope's authority everywhere and always. The Pope, these are his dying words. This is one of the part of the hour or the cross, the heavy cross that we have to bear today. Let us take these dying words of Don Bosco to heart and say, you're right. You're right. The Pope, the Pope. The Salesians must defend the Pope's authority everywhere and always.